um, again that there can be controlled uh, simply by um, when I come to machine the part I just change the radius compensation value of the tool and that will either make the part slightly larger or slightly smaller depending on my requirements so but what I can do now as you can see we have this nice little clearance is we want it to maintain that clearance as it rotates through its movement so if I zoom out of it you can see as the rotor ro the lobes rotate as they're geared together like the previous assembly you can see that we maintain even during the transition between the curve onto the other side of the rotor we maintain that clearance throughout the movement of the part which is how a root style supercharger works now if that clearance is not maintained we will have all sorts of issues either with clashing parts or with uh, clearances becoming too great Another fantastic point of SolarWorks, in this case here I can zoom in really nice and close as you can see that gap looks huge here um, but I can use what's called interference detection and I can come over here and calculate it and it tells me hey we've got no interferences so there's our pretty little housing with our pretty little two low rotors and here's our machined housing our bearing plate our gear cover, some gears which are now scrap metal and some three low rotors and shafts which are also scrap metal but they'll make cool paperweights um, the gear plate um, I changed my, changed my mind on some of the design initially it was going to have a bearing retaining plate um, I decided to try thin up the whole design um, so I removed the bearing retainer plate and as you can see there's still some threaded holes, these threaded holes around the outside of the bearings were for the retaining plate and you can see these little dimples um, it's really fantastic for um, swaging around so the bearings sit about a quarter of a millimetre deeper than the, than the top surface is and then I just use basically a center punch but instead with a sharp point on the end it has a little bull nose and I just give them a good old hard crack around the edge of the bearing, obviously not too much to deform the bearing but just enough to swage over the top lip of the bearing and retain it in place um, we also have some Loctite retaining compound in there so um, truth be told I probably could have got away with just the Loctite because that stuff's pretty amazing but I thought for a little bit of extra security it wouldn't hurt to do that and there's the bottom side of our plate the rotor assembly does have a bearing retaining plate for the backside bearings. Um, they are the small bearings and the ones I expect to fail, so I haven't Loctited them in. I wanted to make them removable if I need to, and the great bit is I can remove them without disassembling the rotors. So once everything's timed up in theory, it can stay there. There's a housing, you can see some contact marks from when I was mucking around with the drill, um, playing with it as I didn't have any shims in it to set the clearances, I was just letting it buzz the end. Um, but the housings come up really good and the surface finish on the on the walls is, is really good and they're very parallel within one hundredth of a millimeter. The gears would have been fantastic. Um, I'm actually pretty happy with the uh, the mesh of the 24 tooth 1.5 module gear. Um, I thought it was going to be a little bit coarse but uh, they, they rotate really nicely together. Uh, they would have been perfect if it weren't for the fact that I've distorted my shafts while pressing them into the aluminium rotors, which is a bit of a shame. Um, the gear retaining method is really simple. What we have if we drop our rotors into the bearing housing like so. So, looks pretty pretty. Let me put our bearing cover on, we have some little quarter inch dowels, they were supposed to be 6mm but turns out I picked up the wrong reamer so we have quarter inch dowels instead but that's not necessarily where the gears I have a 2.5 degree taper on them and as to the shafts you might be able to just see it through there the gears basically drop on there, you can see we've got a millimeter of clearance and then we have these little custom made nuts with a one millimeter pitch on them and they just wind down 
And to set your gear mesh, uh, what you do is you put some screws on here just to retain the plate, make sure everything's in its position as if we were going to run it. And then we're going to insert a shim of our desired clearance that we want. So in this case we're going to have 500 or so, so we have fit a 0.05mm shim or tooth owl for the old schools. Um, and so that it would go tight inside, we put both our gears on, mesh them up grab our nuts and while holding this in the device we'd turn both our nuts in the same direction together so tighten them simultaneously trying to keep our loads even just to try to not distort the shimming um, and that would the gears obviously want to rotate opposite opposite to each other but we're tightening our nuts together um, so they counteract each other in the torque and we would pull those gears down on the taper until they lock solidly and then a few little techniques that you can use once we've finished is we can give um, on the end of the shaft just to stop any the nuts coming loose for a final assembly is we would just use a simple center punch and we could just punch around the outside so it would make the, the last thread uh, form go tight and make it difficult for the uh, for the nut to rattle off and we'll loosen off and then let our, our gears fall off the table or as rough as it may sound, uh, in this case you'd probably get away with probably a bit of Loctite or even if you're really lazy grab the MIG weld and quickly tag them on there um, if I could be bothered you could make up some fancy bending locking uh, washers but to do that you need some form of locating mechanism on the shafts the whole idea is that the shafts are round and free and we don't have to worry about trying to set any uh, or machine any parts in so yeah overall I'm really happy with the fits of everything um, it's come together really good like I say the only downfall has been is that our shafts distorted and it sounds ridiculous it's five hundredths out so it's the thickness of your hair um, distorted but in this in this case I'm not happy to run it with that much uh, distortion both for the gear mesh because it influences that so we've got a little bit of a tight point on the gear and also for the rotor balance and uh, clearances because it all has an effect so it might have spin fine on the end of a battery drill at 2500 RPM but things change a little bit when you spin them up at up to 15,000 driven off a motor instead so I had myself some cool little paperweights in my first set of gear cutting uh, gear cutting pretty straightforward um, calculations for it aren't as in depth as I thought they would be uh, for a simple tooth like this anyway um, even machining them was really straightforward the program is really simple I've got a 24 gear tooth so as you can imagine that's 15 degree divisions over a 360 degree circle um, and it's as simple as telling my milling machine to rotate it 15 degrees run a cut rotate another 15 degrees run a cut um, beauty with CNC's is I don't need to worry about trusting the accuracy of it um, well I do but they get calibrated so it's part of the process of that but I can trust that when I tell my axes to move 15 degrees it's going to move 15 degrees within any possible tolerance that we can maintain um, with this type of gear manufacturing process um, you obviously wouldn't do a production gear like this whatsoever you'd, you'd use what a, what's called a hobbing machine um, which would be more suitable but for these it's good and yeah that's about it really as you can see the three low rotor um, does not use uh, hypercycloid curves it uses just regular arcs but you can maintain the relationship of the curves to each other with a three low rotor effectively what you've created is actually a gear of a sort um, cycloid gears are what existed before involute gears these are involute gears so the little curves off the end of the tooth uh, the involute of the circle or the pitch diameter of the circle that we are using the theory and but as you can see with the three low broder you imagine that spinning reasonably quick they will 
effectively time each other up as a gear. Now, say if we made that into four lobes, I'd be able to turn one and it would run them both of them. Um, but the three lobe rotor surprisingly does maintain good, uh, good contact. Um, but I'm just not entirely happy uh, with the way uh, we'll have a lot more tuning uh, happen with it because effectively even though we may run this at the same RPM as a two lobe rotor we're spinning the air another 33% times around the same part because we have three lobes as, as opposed to two so we will probably end up with more heat uh, the three lobe would be suited to more lower RPMs situations uh, the <coughs> the industry tends to lean towards two low rotors uh, reasoning behind them I haven't found yet I'm guessing for probably a, a combination of efficiency at high RPM and also manufacturing ease uh, I'm expecting this to be quite a bit more uh, efficient than say uh, a regular supercharger off a car due to the fact that everything is precision machined to what's classed as fine tolerances um, for a, a production manufacturing process you wouldn't see a housing like this machined in this manner for um, production perhaps they might pay special focus to getting these walls right so they would use a boring head and a casting of some sort to, to face those to length but something like the rotors would just be an extrusion of aluminium um, typically having a tolerance of plus or minus five hundredths depending on the temperature and the way it's drawn through the mold whereas with a machine billet we can guarantee that we can at least maintain a tolerance of two hundredths uh, of things are temperature controlled and then we can calculate our expansion rates of the aluminium when it's running um, I can also do some um, stress analysis on the rotors as you can see yeah, our, our wall of the rotor is only 3 millimeters at 15,000 rpm we're reaching a surface speed of well in excess of a thousand meters a minute um, so it's fair moving along um, typically when we machine aluminium the surface speed of our cutter cutting the aluminium would, would be around 300 to 500 meters a minute so we're spinning double the speed that we would use to cut it so um, I'm sure you can imagine there's going to be some elongation of of the rotors and, all, and I'm sure you can imagine if they came into contact with the surface speed that high you have nanoseconds before something welds itself together hence the requirement of the gear mesh being so important and the backlash being very important because we have to maintain those tolerances at those RPM Hopefully uh, it's answered a few of your questions and uh, yeah, cheers.